China civilization is both old and extraordinarily rich. If we look, for example, just at philosophy, Confucius is, a rough, is roughly a contemporary of the Buddha in India and Socrates in Greece and was taking on, along with other thinkers at that time, enormous questions of how to order society, what are the roles of members of that society, what is the responsibility of governors. And many of the questions that they were addressing seem very contemporary to us today. If Christianity, Islam and Judaism explored the relationship between man and the divine, Confucianism focused simply on how to order society. To put the world right in order, we first must put the nation in order. To put the nation in order, we must first put the family in order. To put the family in order, we must first cultivate our personal life. We must first set our hearts right. Having lived at a time when small states were constantly battling for territory, Confucius envisioned a future where a centralized government run by scholar administrators would strictly control the military. This line of thought gave rise to an imperial army designed mainly for defensive purposes and usually deployed not around the imperial court but in garrisons along the Great Wall. The Chinese, of course, are the folks who invent paper. We can also, of course, note that the Chinese invent the compass. We note that they invent gunpowder. In terms of selecting officials, the Chinese were far ahead of the West in trying to create a system of meritocracy, a, mer a meritocratic system, where they selected the bureaucrats based on what they knew rather than who they knew. By the 6th century, the ranks of the government administration became open to any Chinese citizen, provided he could pass a comprehensive examination and he possessed the five essential Confucian virtues – benevolence, righteousness, propriety, wisdom and trustworthiness. By this time, Europe was evolving in the opposite direction. The Roman Empire was disintegrating, giving birth to numerous small kingdoms, duchies and principalities, each run by its own monarch in control of his own army. Their administrations were run by the titled aristocracy, a system based on clan heredity and not at all on merit. If European monarchs ruled by divine right with unconditional powers over their subjects, a Chinese emperor needed the mandate of heaven, which was conditional and dependent on him maintaining the economic harmony and, even more importantly, the social harmony. Uh, in brief, I would simply say any co comparison between Christianity and Confucianism must face the fact that one believes in God and the other doesn't. So from that starting point, then how each person deals with the rest of the world uh, is influenced by those ideas. For example, in Christianity, the individual is thought to, be, to have a sense of um, fulfilling himself, being responsible for himself uh, to God as an individual. Whereas in the Chinese context, he primarily o owes his responsibilities to his family. Confucius believed that any member of society, not just the aristocracy and the clergy, could attain great virtues. While Christianity employed faith and prayer for the moral betterment of mankind, Confucianism believed in education, and this education was to take place within the family. Five social relationships defined the status and role of each member. Friend to friend elder brother to younger brother, husband to wife, father to son, were designed to prepare family members for the most important relationship in society, the relationship between subject and ruler. Those who in private life 
behave well towards their parents and elder brothers. In public life, seldom show a disposition to resist the authority of their superiors. And for such men, the thought of starting a revolution has never occurred. means nation state. Guo means state, Jia means family. The two characters put together means nation state. And for centuries and centuries and centuries, the Chinese have been using this phrase. And automatically, in our subconsciousness, the two things are the same. The nation comes first, and the family the second. We think we are the subordinates, uh, a small uh, soldier on the grand chest. We could be easily mobilized and sacrificed, and that's good for the higher purpose of protecting the future of the nation. That's what you might call collectivism, uh, the beauty and ugliness of uh, collectivism. But that's true. There are two Confucianisms. One is the philosophy itself as it emerged in the fifth century BC. The other is the use of Confucius by imperial institutions to legitimize themselves. Um, the, the original Confucianism is basically a philosophy of self-cultivation. Now later on, these qualities uh, were used in a much more opportunistic and instrumental way to claim the obedience of passive subjects. Confucianism became an ideology to justify the autocratic hierarchical rule of a very self-centered and grandiose imperial bureaucracy. And the people down below uh, had very little uh, that they received from this imperial institution uh, by way of virtuous conduct. The Mandate of Heaven took a, a theory of virtue and converted it into a theory of political legitimacy. Uh, your legitimacy was ipso facto conferred by order. If you had an orderly realm, therefore political authority was legitimate. The minute it became disorderly and a dynasty was overthrown, clearly you've lost the mandate of heaven. Very opportunistic and very convenient for those who win. Our rulers understood early that politics are about brutality. If you're brutal enough, you can rule forever. The people knew they couldn't revolt, and the rulers would use any means to keep their rule. That's how they developed a very stable structure, the emperor system. Only a natural disaster would prompt a revolt that would change the dynasty. But then, the same system continued. If the imperial government was tolerant towards religion, it maintained a rigid social structure. At the top was the emperor, followed by the imperial scholar bureaucrats. Then came the landed gentry and small lot farmers. Artisans and manufacturers were also appreciated, but any innovative products had to meet government approval. Finally, at the lowest rung of society were the merchants, banned from government office, banned from riding horses, and at times even banned from wearing expensive clothes. Chinese inventions uh, are impressive and very early. Enormous invention, but not so much innovation of a technologically useful kind. Merchants were always regarded as a threat because they could accumulate money without being under the power of the uh, existing feudal establishment. Um, and without a, a, an entrepreneurial merchant class, the idea of developing wealth and innovating ways of converting inventions into useful technology um, for production, let's say, uh, never really happened. So, for example, gunpowder was used for fireworks. It was not used for explosive projectiles. 
Meanwhile, in an obscure corner of Europe, 25 English noblemen, at odds with a despotic monarch, forced King John of England to sign a document that would bind him by the same laws that applied to them. Magna Carta Libertatum, a 13th century document, introduced the West to the idea of government by consent, a government that would respect and protect the individual rights, freedoms and property. No freeman shall be taken or imprisoned, or be deceased of his freehold, or liberties, or free customs, or be outlawed, or exiled, or any other wise destroyed. Nor will we not pass upon him, nor condemn him, but by lawful judgment of his peers, or by the law of the land. We will not deny or defer to any man either justice or right. The whole problem of individualism is very complicated in the history of China, and it's true that you don't get the kinds of assertions of the primacy of the individual that you get in some of the crucial Western texts. And certainly, if you're thinking in terms of political rights, of you know, how you get to constitutionalism, etc., China is not on a track to that without encountering the outside world. I mean, there are ways in which the state is checked, but they're not through claims of individual rights for the most part. There are certainly indigenous humanist traditions that allow you to make a case against you know, extreme violations of the person. So it's not as if China has no tradition of individual rights, but it doesn't have that same notion that nothing legitimately stands between individual and state, right? That I'm a citizen, I'm in a dialogue in a sense with my government, I have a claim as an individual. In China, you're much more likely to have a claim as a member of a community. And that does set you on a different path of political development. Collectivism is universal, individualism is particular. Collectivism has been the dominant form of thought for the longest period of human history, while individualism is the recognition of equality of moral worth among our people. That is, as individuals, our moral worthness is the same. Again, that originated from this religious idea that in, in front of God, we are equal. So probably in real life, we are not. And you're a billionaire, I'm just a, a penniless person. <laughs> but morally, I don't consider myself inferior to you. This is the fundamental feature of Western individualism. The Chinese don't even have a word for what we would consider individualism or liberty. The one Chinese dictionary I, I saw once said that um, privacy, for example, is the American uh, love of loneliness. <laughs> that was the definition of privacy. And same thing for liberty. They, they really don't have a good equivalent. Um, their institutions developed over a period of two millennia. Um, and they were highly centralized politically. You had a, a very strong imperial court at the center, and then you had a very uh, widely distributed agrarian society at the base. And the two were only loosely connected uh, via uh, an imperial magistrate who was basically an autocrat within his own uh, domain. So no sense of participation, a very hierarchical society. Um, everyone knew exactly what their status was with respect to everyone else. And with highly dense populations, social order becomes more important than, for example, in the Wild West of the United States early days, when population was sparse, people had a lot of room, and if things got too crowded, you could always pack up your covered wagon and go over the next mountain range to a valley where you'd have plenty of fertile soil and sunshine.
like most traditional societies, the Chinese government focused really on just two questions, to maintain order and to live off of the productivity of the world's largest empire. If you look at the period of roughly the 15th century, China was sending expeditions of hundreds of ships into the Indian Ocean. They were visiting places in Southeast Asia, India, and even the coast of Africa. This is more than a century before the discovery of America by Christopher Columbus. And if you took the largest of Columbus's ships, it would easily fit along with two or three others in the largest of these ships. Despite its political and economic stagnation, by the 15th century, China was still the largest, richest nation in the world. Quite opposite to his predecessors, who maintained a strictly defensive military, Emperor Chu Di, who ruled over 110 million Chinese, had built the largest ocean-going navy at that time. In May 1421, lightning struck the imperial palace, sparking a fire that destroyed half of the Forbidden City. By the time his admiral, Zhonghua, returned from abroad, Emperor Chu Di, thinking he'd lost the favor of heaven, had ceded the throne to his son. It was something unprecedented in the history of that time. And when Zheng He returned to China, the Ming Emperor, was so worried that um, the power unleashed by this navigational uh, exploration might be used against China, that he basically dismantled all 200 ships. Uh, and Zheng He died uh, without ever having really made much of a mark, permanent mark. And from that time on, the Chinese eschewed all outward communication with the world and simply lived within their own borders. China thought that we were the central kingdom in the universe. We were the center of the universe. So we welcome all other aliens to kowtow in front of the emperor in the Forbidden City. And we have been governed by this notion for centuries. So China refused to uh, go abroad in search of uh, raw materials and, and and we, we failed, we failed. Um, we failed to expand, not because uh, we were um, mean, we were nasty, uh, we were greedy, but because we were um, aristocratic, noble, um, but uh, noble in the wrong sense, because we thought we were the best, but we were not. Um, and we were given a bitter lesson and the estimation of the importance of trade, and the estimation of the importance of economic development. We paid so much attention and energy to education. It is absolutely true that the Chinese state could intervene at a certain moment and say, we're done with overseas exploration, call it off, stop it, and that you couldn't do the same thing in Europe, right? had Portugal decided to stop, the Netherlands or something would have, would have done it. From that point of view, yes, you have a real difference. What Zheng He was doing was mounting these enormous expeditions to a certain amount to see what was out there, but also to show the flag. What he wasn't doing, and I think this is really critical, is he was not blazing a trail for profit-seeking merchants. Fifty years after the death of Zhonghua, an Italian sea captain was also trying to assemble a fleet to explore the world. If Zhonghua was a civil servant of the Ming Emperor, Columbus was primarily an entrepreneur. As he looked for a government to finance his fleet, Columbus demanded, as payment for his services, one-tenth of all revenues that would come from the new colonies, and that he serve as governor of any territories discovered. His native Genoa turned him down, as did Venice and Portugal. The British monarch considered his proposal, but by the time he said yes, Columbus had already committed 
to Spain. What made them be discover the new world? What produced Columbus and all the um, sailors that went out? Now, then you go back to uh, the very aggressive world in which they all lived in. So all of them sharpening their wits, as it were, on having to kill and not be killed. And that went for hundreds of years. The war of religions, the war against the Muslims. The Christian world was actually trying to hold back an external enemy, while at the same time fighting among themselves almost continuously for hundreds of years. And to go out and make the money, to have the money, to be have better guns, to, be to, to have an advantage over your next enemy, and so on, was all the people were engaged in. This did not happen in China. The country, China was peaceful, Yes, agriculture, there was, uh, there was the enemy on very far frontier. The vast majority of the Chinese people lived peacefully. 